taking that, and we'll go in that order. So uh, first, let me introduce to you Professor Marcus Kreuzer. Um, Marcus is Associate Professor and Graduate Director in the Political Science Department at Villanova. His work deals with origins of democracy, comparative political economy, and globalization. Marcus received his PhD from Columbia University, a master's degree from the London School of Economics, and his BA from the University of British Columbia in Canada. His book, Institutions and Innovations, Voters, Interest Groups, and Parties in the Consolidation of Democracy, France and Germany, 1870 to 1939, was published by the University of Michigan Press in 2001. His scholarly work has appeared in several book collections and in academic journals in his field. Please help me welcome Professor Marcus Kreutz. I will have to stand so that my clicker isn't in reach here. Um, Okay, well, thanks very much. I mean, what we're trying to do here with this symposium is both try to sort of understand the causes of uh, this recent economic crisis, as well as some of its uh, implications. And um, what I like to talk about today is uh, the implications, particularly for social policy. That is, in, in any economic crisis, you have significant economic dislocation. And during this economic dislocation, you have a lot of people who lose and some people uh, who benefit. And so what I'm trying to do is understand uh, who the losers are and who the winners are and what factors determine uh, who is bearing the costs and the benefits of an economic crisis or larger uh, economic uh, sort of transformations like uh, the globalization. And generally, I mean, if you were here in the previous speaker, I got a little bit uh, irritated towards the end, in part because the, the, I thought, in my opinion, the previous speaker just sort of painted things in a way too broad of, of, of a brush. Uh, I think it, it's, it's, it's important. I mean, he sort of gave you this big Marxist indictment of, 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 of capitalism. And I, it just, uh, life is more complicated than sort of big, grand, theoretical uh, categories. And so the way I'm trying to add a little bit of nuance and, and, and differentiation is to compare um, how the American social safety net has performed relative to the European social safety net in uh, sort of cushioning uh, the costs of economic uh, transformation. So what I'll do is, is first, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of even in its attempt to differentiate, uh, I lump a lot of things together and, and, and overgeneralize things generally. But what I'll start out with is first uh, making a few differentiations between this type of social safety net in Europe as opposed to the United States. And then I'll focus in more specifically on how these different uh, forms of social policies affect the outcomes of labor markets. Because labor markets is really you know, an employment is where most of the economic costs and benefits are uh, distributed and how labor markets are regulated therefore gives us a little bit of an insight why generally speaking losing economically in Europe uh, is less costly than losing economically here in the United States. So let me start at first uh, by uh, juxtaposing two broad different conceptions of welfare in the United States and Europe. I mean, during the recent healthcare debate, you had, you know, Europe was socialism, and here in the United States, we had libertarianism. And so that sort of difference uh, underlines two uh, broader uh, differences. Here in the United States, uh, if you ask most people what welfare is about, it's, it's the first word, if I ask that by a student, I get, it's handouts. So the assumption is that welfare policies are redistributive. You take from the rich and you give to the poor. And what goes with this notion of welfare as handouts is the idea that welfare is essentially an individual responsibility. Everybody is responsible for providing for their own retirement, their own health care, all these other benefits. And there are some good arguments for this. The United States is a huge country. It is very diverse. So different groups have different preferences on what constitutes welfare. 
and therefore to make the individual the primary uh, in agent responsible makes sense rather than the government uh, that would provide a one-size-fits-all uh, welfare solution. Uh, then also there's this argument that market-based uh, welfare solutions tend to be more efficient than uh, those provided by the government and also that if you have too much welfare it tends to undermine entrepreneurialism. In Europe, on the other hand, and here I'm, I'm greatly overgeneralizing, the idea of welfare is slightly different. It's talked about as social protection or as social insurance. They think of welfare more the way we think of car insurance, right? It's a form of pooling uh, your, uh, your risks. And so with this idea of welfare, social protection, goes the idea that it's a collective responsibility. In some instances, it's even a social right. The, you know, just as your right to free speech or to vote, uh, to have certain minimal social protections is something that the government ought to provide you with. Um, there's also the belief that um, you know, social protections are important for maintaining political stability, social cohesion, and even the argument that welfare enhances economic uh, efficiency. So these are sort of two very broad different conceptions uh, of uh, welfare that we find in the US and Europe. Now, in terms of this broad sort of philosophical difference, it then translates into uh, specifically different policies across a wide set of policy areas. So here you have different forms of social protection. Uh, the six major categories of social protection is disability, health, labor markets, old age, family, and education. And so what I list here is just the particular risks that are associated uh, with these different policy areas. So if you're disabled, right, the risk is you, depending on the severity of your disability, you can't provide for yourself, you can't work. So you need certain protection uh, to uh, help you with uh, uh, those risks. Health, uh, you know, the major risk there is, is, is sickness in the labor market. The risks are that you lose your job or that your particular skill set uh, are no longer what the labor market uh, uh, demands. And then again, you know, you have a variety of range of protections that uh, can be provided, old age and so forth. So you have a whole range of um, different set of, of, of risks and then the respective policies or protections that go with it. In the far right, column, right? The, the little boxes with the checkbox and the Xbox is just to give you an idea of the, the differences in some of these policy areas between the United States and Europe. So when it comes to disability, this is actually one form of social protection where the United States is far more generous. It offers far greater protections than most European uh, uh, countries. The Europeans are just trying to catch up with you know, disability legislation and, 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 and so forth. Um, when it comes to health care, well, I mean, uh, depending on what happened last week, we might be catching up with the Europeans. But by and large, you know, the, the health care benefits tend to be uh, better in Europe than in the United States. Same thing when it comes to labor markets. And the, when it comes to old age, uh, we have social security. European countries also have sort of a minimum uh, form of, of old age retirement protection. When it comes to family policies, child care, maternity leave, you know, uh, there's a huge difference here between Europe and uh, the United States with the policies being much more uh, extensive, and the protection is more extensive in Europe than in the United States. And in education, it's again fairly comparable. Uh, one thing I just actually wanted to point out here in terms of uh, these social protections, notice that we're talking here about um, the economic crisis, right, and its uh, implications for, for um, uh, the, the risks that it poses. But many of the risks that we face uh, in life are non-economic. <coughs> that is, the, 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 the major risks to, to our welfare are non-economic in origins. Disabilities or, or, or health, this has nothing to do with, with health care. So many of the, the, the social protections are actually non-economic. But what I would like to do today is, is focus on labor markets because you know, this is a symposium on the, uh, the current economic crisis and just try to give you a little bit of a sense of what some of the differences are 
in labor market relations between the United States and, um, and Europe and what difference these policies uh, uh, make. So, oops, the wrong direction. So here are a few statistics. First look at on the far left uh, corner, entry into poverty. This is a statistic that looks what percent in any given year, what percentage of the working population falls into poverty. And poverty here, I think, is defined as 50% uh, of the median uh, income. And what you notice if you go down the column is there's relatively little variation across countries. So the factors that create poverty right, seem to be uniform across all different countries. People get sick at equal rates. People have disabilities at equal rates. People are laid off at equal rates in different countries. Hence, the relatively narrow range of the percentages of people who in any given year enter poverty. But move on to the next column, the exit of poverty. This here looks like in any given year, those who are, who last year fell below the poverty level, what percentage of that population size moves out of poverty again? And what you notice here, some huge differences. And one thing that is striking, and I'm just highlighting it by contrasting the United States with Denmark, in the United States, roughly only one third of those who entered poverty exited the next year which is half the rate of what happens in Denmark, or is also significantly lower in the exit rates for most other European countries. So, um, and what this also then translates is, is the poverty line. Notice that uh, the people, the percentage of the people then over the long term who remain below the poverty line, again, is relatively high in the United States, and is somewhat lower in some of the European countries. So this raises the question, well, what is so different in Europe and the United States? Are Europeans just better at pulling themselves up at their bootstraps? Or is it that maybe somebody is uh, giving them a helping hand? And my answer is, it is the, the helping hand that accounts for uh, the higher rate of, of exits from poverty in Europe <coughs> than in the United States. Now, I'm just going to focus here on, on the labor market. I mean, the, the, these, whether you exit from, uh, from poverty is the net result of a, a very complicated process, right? So I don't want you to come away saying, well, because Europeans have such and such labor markets, there is less poverty than in the United States. Uh, the labor markets here are just meant to illustrate the effect of one set of, of, of social policies in trying to alleviate the costs of economic dislocation. So what is then so different in the labor markets between labor markets? Essentially, labor market protections come into three different categories. The first one is income replacement. What happens if you're laid off? What financial assistance does uh, the government provide you with in order to compensate for your loss of income because you're out of job? The second one uh, category where labor market policies matter in terms of employability. What sort of programs are there in, in effect to help you re-enter the labor market? And, Thirdly, what sort of protections were there in the first place that made it more difficult for an employer to lay a worker off? And if you look at these three different rows here, you will notice some very important uh, differences between the United States uh, and Europe. In terms of income uh, replacement, it's just a fancy word in the type of unemployment benefits that you get. In the United States, they are, first of all, they're contingent on prior uh, employment. So you only can get unemployment benefits if you were employed before. So if you, as a college student, right, graduate and can't find a job, you're out of luck. Nobody's going to help you economically because you had no prior employment. 
Uh, in, um, in Europe, on the other hand, unemployment benefits tend to be universal. So that even a college graduate entering the labor market unable to find work gets some form of uh, economic support. In the United States, the benefits tend to be very short term. I mean, it's usually six months, and then depending on the severity of a crisis, the government can extend them. And the re replacement rate is also very, very low. I mean, it's, I think it taps out at $1,700 uh, per, per, per family. Uh, in Europe, on the other hand, the wage replacement rate is generally between 50 and 70 percent of your prior salary. So, uh, you know, you can more or less keep paying your mortgage, you can keep uh, um, uh, your, 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 your lifestyle, you have to tighten the belt a little bit. And so the, the, the short-term implications of losing your jobs, therefore, are significantly softened. In terms of employability, uh, here essentially if you're out of work and you want to retrain or change careers, that's your responsibility, right? Or, um, or that of your employer. I mean, if you're employed and an employer wants you to sort of upgrade your skills, the employer can give you, sometimes they pay for tuition or uh, you get a tax uh, a credit. So essentially it's a private responsibility. Whereas in the European case, it's a collective and public responsibility. That if you're unemployed, you know, there are all sorts of free job training programs or university programs that are very often tied to your unemployment benefits. And to some extent, that makes sense because when you're laid off, you're short of money, you're not going to take out, I mean, it takes a lot of guts to take out student loans, right? if you're laid off by having a mortgage and, and, and have to support a family. So to some extent, by having the government take care of these retraining programs, you increase the likelihood that a person whose skills are obsolete can retrain and then re-enter the labor market and uh, provide for himself or, or herself. There are also differences in, in terms of uh, training the, the, the young. I mean, the, there are extensive apprenticeship training programs in most European countries that we uh, don't know here in the United States. And finally, in terms of employment protections, that is, how easy is it for an employer to lay off workers? Again, there are huge uh, differences here between the US and Europe. In the US, we have essentially, in most instances, employment at will, right? It's a handshake. Uh, whatever you and the employer agrees, that's the conditions of your employment. If a, a contract is, is, is terminated, this can be done um, at, at very uh, short notice. In Europe, on the other hand, it's very heavily regulated, and that creates its own uh, particular problems. But, you know, if you're laid off, you have to give the person four months' notice, and depending on how many years you work, you get so many months of, of, of severance payment. Um, and that, uh, again, makes it much more difficult to lay somebody uh, off. Um, in terms of union, you know, Europe has much higher rates of unionization and is partly a reflection of much more union-friendly uh, labor laws that makes it easier for unions to organize and, uh, and, 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 and go on strike. Again, this can be a double-edged sword, right? Uh, and had, had created some sort of problems in, in, in the 1970s. But by and large, that provides important protections for, for workers. And, uh, and in terms of immigration, here in the United States, there's much more competition, particularly in low-wage sectors, through immigration. Uh, this is part of, of, of you know, American uh, sort of history and tradition that is in an immigration country. Uh, but in many European countries, immigration is heavily restricted, and um, that provides some sort of protections uh, for workers. So you can see these sort of differences. It's, in Europe, it's more difficult to lay somebody off, and if you're laid off, then there is more support for you. And if you put those two things together, you get some sort of insight of how a difference in social policy makes it easier for somebody uh, in Europe who drop below the poverty line to exit again because he or she has that uh, helping hand.
Okay, well, great, I'm coming to the end anyway. Um, so, one final uh, thought. So, the question is, why do we have these differences, right? Why do we have uh, a more general welfare state in Europe than we do here in the United States? And, again, this is a very complicated uh, question to answer. I'm just can highlight a few factors. One is, there's some important differences in terms of the political institutions uh, that became very apparent during the recent health care report. The United States essentially is a system of checks and balances. That it is a system that it was created in order to make it, you know, the, the American families were very suspicious of democracy and the majority will. They were concerned of a tyrannical majority and of an, a government that might be too activist and, and too interventionist. So they created a, a system where, you know, you have to pass by a supermajority in the Senate, a majority by the House, and you can have a veto from the president, and you have the constitutional court who can block things. So historically, in the United States, social reforms very often were blocked uh, or delayed because it was so difficult to pass uh, and overcome these constitutional checks and balances. In Europe, on the other hand, you have none of that in many instances. All you need is you have simple parliamentary majority, you pass it, that's done. Uh, and that historically reflects the strong role that socialist parties had in designing the political institutions. Socialists didn't want a government you know, whose hands were tied. They wanted a government that could act decisively and, and quickly, and therefore did not want to give these constitutional checks and balances that sometimes allowed relatively small groups to block uh, important social reforms. So that's one important difference. Another one is Europe traditionally had a much stronger left, uh, socialist parties. There, you know, there were some socialist parties here in the United States, but I think they never uh, won more than eight or nine percent in national presidential elections. Why is the left stronger in Europe than in the United States? Again, there are many, many uh, factors. One important factor is that is that in the United States, class, right, which was the basis for um, uh, a strong socialist party, class in the United States has always been diluted by ethnic and religious differences. So you may have been working class, but you were Irish working class, Catholic working class, um, and then of course race being another dimension that uh, weakens the salience of class as a factor around which it is relatively easy to organize uh, workers. And, um, and third and finally is, is, I mean, if you look historically at when most of the European sort of welfare state uh, grew, much of the growth occurred in the post-war era. And this was a direct response to the specter of communism and fascism during the interwar period. You know, the, the European democracies that faltered in the interwar pe period, particularly uh, Weimar Germany or, or, or Italy, and to some extent also the political instability in, in, in France, were seen as a byproduct of an excessive class struggle, that, that these political uh, party systems were, were too polarized, and this polarization uh, was largely the result of uh, uh, class differences. And so, what the, the, the white health believed was in order to make court, uh, capitalism more compatible with democracy, you needed more of a sort of redistributive welfare system that um, eased some of these class differences um, that gave rise on the left to communism and on the right uh, to fascism. And this was sort of uh, an, an attempt to do so and it has been uh, rather successful. Okay? Thank you very much. Well, uh, I think what we're going to do is we're, we're trying to keep the presentations to about 25 minutes each, so we'll have at least 20 minutes or so for question and answer and further discussion. Okay? So thank you very much, Marcus. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Durrett Little Bird. <laughs> Durrett is the director of the Pro of Program Quality Support Department of Catholic Relief Services. 
In this capacity, she ensures the provision of technical assistance to over 99 country programs in emergency response, health, HIV and AIDS, agriculture, water and sanitation, education, microfinance, peace building, partnership, and monitoring and evaluation. She also ma manages the implementation of a government-funded anti-retroviral therapy treatment uh, project of over $525 million in nine countries in Africa and the Caribbean. From 2000 to 2004, Durrett served as Deputy Executive Director of CRS's Overseas Operation, where she provided policy and strategic guidance to CRS's operations worldwide, managing an annual portfolio of $500 million and a staff of 3,500 people. From 1997 to 2000, she was country representative for CRS in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. She also served as CRS country representative in Dakar, Senegal from 1993 to 1997. Before joining CRS, Durrett worked as a research specialist for the African Development Foundation. She was the deputy director for the National Council of Negro Women, worked as a consultant for the African Development Foundation, was the administrative financial officer for AfriCare in Niger, West Africa, and worked as a research associate for the Center for Policy Research. Durrett holds an MA in International Studies from the University of Denver, Colorado, and a BA from Brandeis University. Please help me welcome Durrett Bird Little. Good afternoon, everyone. 25 minutes, and then we'll go. Oh, it'll be less space. than that. Okay. Good, good afternoon, and uh, welcome. Um, uh, this presentation, as you see, is on the effectiveness of social safety nets, and I am going to speak about it within the context of uh, countries overseas that are quite poor. So I'm talking about uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, I'm talking about parts of Asia, um, India, um, uh, Latin America, the Caribbean, Haiti in particular, and so um, that's the context. And in, in it, we, you know, we, this is a series of presentations, and I just want to say that uh, the, the, the subject of social safety net is particularly important because these countries, well, globally, uh, these countries have undergone a series of crises within the last, I would say, four years. From, say, about 2006 to 2009, there was a food crisis when, um, and you might have heard about the riots in various countries because food prices had skyrocketed, and people who are living on a dollar a day, a dollar twenty-five a day, two dollars a day, and spend an inordinate amount, you know, 40, 50, 60 percent of their income, cannot afford uh, uh, food when, I mean, they can hardly afford it, you know, on their two dollar or dollar twenty-five a day income, much less when the price of food has, uh, has gone up by 40, 50 percent. So there was a food crisis, there was also the fuel crisis, and here in the United States, uh, you may recall a few years ago that price food uh, uh, fuel had gone up to a dollar six to uh, about four dollars a gallon, and then there was a recent financial crisis. So all of these countries have been buffeted very significantly by these crises. So the end result was really to push a lot of people down into poverty, or people who would have otherwise escaped poverty remained in poverty because of these crises. And so the World Bank was estimating that there's more than a billion people that are hungry and that suffer from undernourishment. Uh, and in terms of the safety net, uh, most of these countries <coughs> do not have sufficient resources to establish safety net programs. And so um, I'm going to take this in a different direction because there just aren't safety net programs in most of the places where we work. Next. Um, so just as a little background, um, most of you are familiar with safety net pro with what they are, right? I don't need to go into those definitions, so I can uh, I'll skip on. Um, yeah, just just keep going. Yeah, yeah, keep yeah, <coughs> switch. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, keep keep going. So um, you know, I'm 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 gonna stand over here. Uh, so the, the, these are what the programs in safety net help people to do. 
to, to address the challenges that they're currently facing and really to live a life um, of, of dignity um, when, they are, when people are facing these challenges. So um, in many of these countries, what happens is that you have international charitable organizations such as Catholic Relief Services, there's also Care, World Vision, Save, and so on, who work in these countries to serve the very poor, the most marginalized, the elderly, children, and so on. The Catholic Relief Services is the overseas development uh, organization of the U.S. Catholic bishops. And, w and the programs that we implement um, provide, to me, they serve as social safety net. They provide many of the same functions as the safety net programs in the West, in, in Europe or in the United States, in that they serve to transfer resources and to provide assistance to the very poor and in a sustainable way where people can try to find their ways out of poverty. We approach these, the, the kind of approach we use in these types of programs is looking through the lens of integral human development. And integral human development is derived from the teachings of the Catholic Church. Um, if you look at the principles of Catholic social teaching, the option for the poor, rights and responsibility, the common good, and which is actually the title of this overall workshop, you will see references, you, you will see the roots of, of, uh, of integral human development. And there are also the encyclicals, the first one, Rerum Novarum, some of you might be familiar with it, which talked about workers and, and their condition and their rights. So we take this approach, so we, we, we adhere to the principle of integral human development in our work. And this is what Pope uh, Paul VI had to say that uh, development is not, we, we call what we do international development, but for us it's not just economic development, it's really focusing on the whole person. Um, so that genuine development is integral, it has various dimensions to it. Um, so this, you can go and you know, go to the, to the OCCB website, uh, the Vatican website, and you can read more. So this is the approach that we take. And this is our objective, that the people that we serve, again, the poor, the marginalized, uh, realize their full human potential and that they live in communities in just and peaceful society because that too is important and we have worked in places where we focus on the economic and then you know it goes up rwanda is a place that comes to mind with the genocide uh, in rwanda okay and so you know integral human development promoting the good of every person and the whole person so not just food and shelter but also the spiritual component and that it's, it's economic, it's, it's social, it's spiritual, it's political. Um, so. Go on. Now, when we try to, to um, and, and I should say that other organizations, um, that, that we, we, when we, when we approach our work, one area that in which we approach it is on sustainable livelihood because that is so important for many of these communities. We, you know, we say resource poor communities. These are very poor communities, as I said, living on, you know, a dollar twenty-five a day, two dollars a day. So livelihood is very important and sustainable livelihood that's not harming the environment and that can really help to lift people out of poverty. And other organizations also uh, um, address issues of sustainable livelihood at the household and at the community level. We differ from DFID, which is the British USAID, you know, the British Foreign uh, uh, Development Assistance Agency, um, CARE, which is a, a US, an international charity, but you know, started in the United States, Oxfam and others. We differ from them in that we look at the whole person. So not just the livelihood, the income, the economic component, but the whole person. And so when we take the principle of integral human development and we try to operationalize integral human development by using this framework. And in the, the in the, many of the places where we work, you know, when we 
uh, work in a community with our local partners, a local church, for example, we, even though people are poor, they have assets. You know, they have things that they can bring to the table, and it's a much more respectful way of engaging with people so that they bring something. They have rights, they have responsibilities, and they bring something to the table. Uh, in many places, there are shocks and, and, and uh, cycles and trends. Trends could be um, decreasing rainfall pattern over time, which affects agricultural production. Um, the cycles could be that um, you know there are uh, uh, the monsoons which come each year in east in eastern India. We know there's going to be flooding in Bangladesh and India and so on. Our shocks are like Haiti, boom, you know the earthquake happens. So how do we work with communities to prepare themselves for these kinds of uh, events, right? And then there's structures and systems in India. If you're working. If could be working in a, in a community where there are the Dalits, that you know they were called the untouchables, but the more respectful term are the Dalits, and the community could say, you know, we CRS, we need, and, and the local church, we need help with water, but it might be that the Dalits can't use the same wells as everybody else in the village. So, and the structures and systems, the attitudes, the, the history, the tradition is such that these people are excluded and marginalized. Um, and so, we, you know, this is something that we have to talk about with those communities and the local partners. And all of these combine together into various strategies that communities adopt and the outcomes that they get. And so that's how we, because it's one thing to talk about the human dignity and the whole person. But what does it really mean? How do you put that into practice? We tr put it into practice using this kind of a framework. Okay. So the, the, the programs in CRS, as I said, I feel that they contribute to the social safety net. And they're in a wide variety of sectors, um, such as you see listed here. Okay. So in agriculture, and, and again, you know, people's lives are not um, are, are complicated, just like our lives are complicated, the lives of the poor are also complicated. So if you're doing agriculture, it's not just to produce, it is, well, what does the market want? So you have to look at the market. You know, how does your local production contribute to the health of your children? Um, there's agriculture, in, in Haiti, for example, right now, um, there's a huge thing to distribute seeds, and we push back on the big donors and USAID on um, Monsanto wanted to distribute seeds to say there's a, there's a better way, and we should respond to it, it, agriculture in an emergency setting by using different methodologies that don't undermine local farmers, local sellers of seeds, local distribution channels. So when we look, we look holistically, and this would be say one area, agriculture for all these very agriculture for environment, so that people don't, um, uh, actually, in Ethiopia, for example, uh, you would do contouring in, in agriculture to preserve hillsides, to restore the vegetative cover, so that when it rains, water is absorbed into the subsoil and, and can refill the, the underground water uh, system, so that the wells can then produce water once again because you have done your agriculture in such a way that people can produce, you're rehabilitating the environment, and the wells become productive once more. Um, education, very, very important, especially for, for children in emergency situation and for girls. And so we um, set up our agriculture programs so that we are contributing to the long-term viability of these communities because the poor and the marginalized can get educated. And I should also say that even in, in an emergency situation, a re-establishing education program is very important because it provides a safe zone for children so that they aren't abducted and trafficked. It, psychologically, it restores a sense of normalcy because they're back in a school <coughs> environment. They can get fed if there's a school feeding component, so it helps nutritional status. So again, providing a variety of good for those children. Yes. Um, healthcare, you know, very critical uh, in many of these communities. 
and you know, pregnant women, the elderly, um, severely malnourished children. Um, in, for the malnourished children, I remember working in Liberia, and this was when Liberia was going for a civil war, and we were providing food to uh, doctors without borders because they had these therapeutic feeding programs going, where severely malnourished children would come with the mothers, and they'd be fed like every two hours uh, with the food that we were providing to help restore them to health. Um, and then, of course, long term, we know uh, the, the benefits. It, when, when children are undernourished, especially within the first two years of, of life, it has long term consequences, both for cognitive development, physical development, productivity, health status, and outcome <coughs> all, you know, in, into adulthood. So it's not just a short term thing, it, it has long term consequences. HIV and AIDS, uh, this is particularly in countries in Kenya, in Southern Africa, where the HIV AIDS prevalent rate is very high, providing home-based care for people who are bedridden. Um, they need water, they need food, they need firewood, they need people to go and visit with them, so it's psychologically to be accompanied uh, in their situation. Providing antiretroviral therapy uh, to people who are illiterate, they're in, in remote rural areas. Um, you know, how do they get the drugs? to help restore them to life. And these are some of the programs. Orphans, there are households that I've visited where the head of the household is 15 because the parents have died, the grandparents have also died, and they're caring for their siblings, sometimes cousins. And you know, how do they learn how to, to if they're in an agricultural area, they have to learn how to, how to grow crops. But the parents aren't there to teach them the girls need to learn how to care for a family. There's a whole host of things. How do they go to school? Do they have clothes? Do they have school fees? You know, do they have the wherewithal to, to live a normal life? So huge programs to care for these children. And you, you, we might say, well, justice and peace building, how can, what does this have to do with social welfare? But, but sometimes when there are severe crises in these countries, <coughs> conflicts do erupt over um, resources uh, or over perceived unequal access or distribution of resources. So if we can bring communities together to talk about what's going on, if we can, if I, I use the example of India, you know, if we, if a well is going to be put into a community which is a good, a public good, um, if we can get the, 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 the different castes to be sitting down, you know, um, actually a, a prime example was in India, in Gujarat, after that big earthquake, I think it was 2001 or 2002, and we were distributing non-food items and so on to help people to just get back on their feet, meeting their basic needs. Well, some of the items we found out were that the, the, the Dalits were not getting what they were supposed to get. And people, some of the leaders in those communities thought that it was okay, they're Dalit, why should they get what we're getting? You know, we're higher caste people. And, and so um, a huge discussion ensued and actual Sierra staff, expatriate staff was asked to leave because the village was gonna talk about this. But it had to be done with our Indian staff in such a way that it would enhance or promote peace and understanding rather than serve to tear the community apart. apart. So even though you know you might be wondering what does it have to do with social welfare, everything to do with it because you want to minimize or mitigate and prevent conflict. Um, these types of programming, microfinance, are also incredibly important in helping people. Um, these are small loans. You know, loans can be like twenty dollars, thirty dollars that people take and engage in some kind of productive activity. So here in the US, for example, uh, a safety net program might be public works, where people might go work to build uh, bridges or roads. But here, you can get a $20 loan uh, for six months. They have to pay interest. They have to save. And um, they have to do something productive with the loan. And over time, over, if the program goes for a year or for six months, they're building up a nest egg. And maybe at the end of the six months or the end of the year, somebody might have saved, you know, fifteen dollars, ten dollars. But if your annual household uh, annual income is a hundred dollars a year, and you save ten dollars or fifteen dollars, you know, just think about saving ten percent or fifteen percent of your annual income. 
and, and, and these types of programs does relieve some pressures on the government because people are productively engaged, which is what the social safety net programs do, because otherwise they can lead to violence and political instability. Um, and you know, I mentioned water already, so I, you know, I won't even go into that. And uh, we, we talked earlier about the effectiveness of the, the, you know, the title is the effectiveness of social safety net programs, and this is how we try to get at measuring and, and knowing you know, what's going on. Are we achieving the targets, the, the objectives of the program? You know, what are the best practices that we're seeing? What are we learning? You know, what mistakes are being made? How do we correct for that through our monitoring and evaluation? Our programs. And just to recap, you know, that we, we contribute to social safety net, we, we try to strive to, for the common good, um, uh, focusing on the option for the poor, and um, promoting the good of every person, the whole person. Okay? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Oh, thanks. Thank you very much for two great presentations. Now we have time um, for a question and answer to further discussion. The floor is open. Maybe I'll moderate. Yes. All right, I'll make a, an observation and then just ask for your response. And that's because of the, the different political systems between the US and most European countries, subtract the UK, mm -hmm. and their approach to social safety net, that the US has developed an ethos, whether it's the cart or the horse came first, the ethos or the approach to the social sector. And we developed a very robust uh, nonprofit sector mm -hmm. here in the United States, where uh, mainland Europe does not have a robust um, nonprofit sector, but those services are provided by the government and always have been. That the argument is that in the United States, we don't need the types of social safety that's provided by the government. What we should have given our libertarian approaches versus our uh, socialist approaches to government, we should just have a more robust social sector to complement um, our small government. And that we should also be supporting that when we are providing international aid. And that's why international aid from the U.S. tends to focus on independence, you know, and it's taking this approach towards um, people bootstrapping and it's going to take more of an approach to social entrepreneurialism and microfinancing as opposed to charity, which you would get more from a European perspective. Um, yeah, uh, good, good question. Um, in terms of, um, you use the word ethos, right? That, that here in the United States we have an, an ethos of, of, of non-profit sector and that is, is sort of uh, more in tune with our libertarian sensibilities and, and, and suspicion um, of, uh, of, of, of government. Two, two comments in, in, in response to that. Um, the first one is, is the, um, the nonprofit sector. I mean, I don't know the exact history here in, in the United States, but at least you have seen in Europe also um, a growth of, of, of the nonprofit sector. And this was largely in response, you know, after the first big, huge wave of expansion of government-run welfare programs, right? And, uh, and in the 1970s, you had sort of a crisis of the welfare state, where people sort of realized, look, I mean, this is all way too centralized, right? That uh, you have significant regional disparities um, in, in terms of the particular welfare needs of, of, of different groups or different uh, regions, that sometimes these huge uh, centralized bureaucracy, it's very difficult to hold them accountable. And so in response to those criticisms of uh, centralized government-run uh, welfare programs, you have a move to sort of contract out some of these uh, social services to nonprofit sectors. And, uh, you know, I mean, this was part of sort of the neoliberal uh, Thatcher Reagan response of how to reform make the, the welfare state uh, uh, more, more nimble. So you see that in, in, in some European countries. Then you, you have, what I gave you here in terms of the European version of the welfare state was actually um, an overgeneralization because it collapses the Scandinavian or social democratic welfare state with a distinctly different continental European welfare state that is actually much closer to the sort of non-profit based welfare state model that you were talking about. 
um, and that in, 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 in the continental welfare state uh, model, what you see, uh, it's a very big that, that religious institutions, particularly churches, assume a much more important role in, in the delivery of child care or, or um, and running of hospitals, I'm just like like here in, in the United States. And the other thing that is very unique is you have professional associations playing a very important role. So you have unemployment benefits and health care plans in Germany being run by things like the Bar Association or, or the, the Medical Association or whatever the professional uh, uh, group that, and this comes out of a tradition of, of guilds, right, that guilds in, in medieval Europe played a very important role in training and providing um, camaraderie as well as extensive welfare benefits to members of that professional category. And that tradition carried over in, into modern times. And so what, what the government does in these situations is very much the same thing that it does here with the nonprofit sector. Right? It sets certain general guidelines that there's a, a certain minimum threshold of benefits that everybody uh, ought to, um, ought to um, obtain. Uh, it uh, provides some administrative uh, accountability, it checks the books of, of these agencies. And for some professional categories, for example, that do not have the same financial means as others, it provides some, uh, some subsidies. So this, this nonprofit model already uh, exists. And, and ironically enough, that is the, the welfare state model that uh, has been the most consistent. You know, it didn't go the way the British model went, all centralized, and then the pendulum swung back to sort of the nonprofit model. And it has been relatively uh, uh, stable and, and, um, and effective. Yeah, Anna? Maybe uh, related to that. Um, I liked your, was your first or second slide that showed um, the perceptions and the purpose mm -hmm. of safety nets in the United mm -hmm. States and, um, and in Europe. So I guess my question is two parts. Um, the first is that social safety nets obviously come at a cost, right? So in, is it, ta you know, our taxes, obviously, cost is going to be taxes. Our taxes <laughs> actually higher in European versus American countries. And, um, and what are they not spending on if they are spending on social safety nets? What are they not spending their money on otherwise that the United States might be, if you have any idea of what that is? And then my second part of the question is how are there differences in the perceptions of the costs? Of social safety nets, like how you know how do Europeans? What do Europeans view the cost of safety nets to be? Are they are they more willing to accept the costs versus the United States? Um, okay, uh, the second one is a little bit more difficult. So let me take the easy one first. Yeah, I mean, of, of course, these 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 uh, social safety nets come at a cost. I mean, usually, it's it's a higher form of of, of, of tax rate, right? Uh, that you you get taxed somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of, 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 of your marginal income, depending on which particular country you're even living in. Even for like lower and middle classes? Sorry? Even for lower and middle classes? Or is it just higher taxes for wealthier people? Well, I mean, that's sort of one of the peculiar things, is, is, is that uh, U.S. tax rates are far more progressive mm -hmm. than many European tax rates. I mean, one of the bizarre things about this health care reform is that you stick at the cost to people making over $100,000, right? I mean, they are paying for most of the health care expenses, which I think is, is I don't know, it might be politically wise, but in terms of... Isn't it 250000 $250,000? Yeah, I think it's $250,000. $250,000, okay. or, or I mean, even more so. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. You know, I mean, which which is sort of... Um, I mean, if, if everybody is, 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 is benefiting from this health care reform, why not distribute the cost across different income categories in some sort of, you know, progressive manner. Because, you know, if you benefit, you should also contribute. Um, so, yes, so you, 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 you spend higher taxes. But, you know, by the same token, it's tax season, right? So every time around this time of year, I, I sort of add up what I put aside for my health insurance and, um, and my retirement funds and forget it, saving for college, right? And that puts me in the same tax bracket as, as I probably would be in, in, in a European country. But your so, kids' education is free yeah. and healthcare is uh, taken care of. And, mm -hmm. and in terms of the perception of, of, the, of the costs is what particularly 
the Scandinavian, the, the social um, democratic, uh, the northern countries did with a lot of their programs, is, um, <clears throat> you know, at first the, the thing was, you know, we, we, we're working class representatives and we need to redistribute wealth to alleviate uh, uh, poverty. Uh, but very quickly they sort of realized that that is politically not sustainable, right? Because uh, there are more wealthy people than there were uh, 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 poor people. And so what, what they decided to sort of do is, is create welfare programs at a very high level of quality. So the, the, the public, I mean, it's just the same thing. Like growing up in, 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 in Switzerland, right, the public schools, if you went to private school, the connotations of private schools were essentially you were not a particularly smart individual and your parents had a lot of money. That is, they bought you the degree on... Uh, you know, on, 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 on private education. So the, the public education was so top-notch across that people didn't mind paying whatever it needed to be paid because it was first-rate quality. The same thing with, with, with the, the health care, the same thing with uh, university education and, 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 and child care. So if you provide... Um, you know, I mean, th does it matter to me whether, you know, I pay for a, a, a top uh, child care program for my kids through my uh, personal uh, private expenses or through a little bit higher taxes if it's provided to the government, I think at the end of the day you don't really uh, care um, uh, that much. And so I think that's sort of a, one way in which you try to um, diffuse, right, that I'm paying and not getting anything in, in, in return by creating these high quality programs. I, I just want to follow up on that. I mean, there's another sense in which the, the perceptions are different. I mean, in the United States, as opposed to other countries, just because of kind of the historical developments in this country, welfare, the social safety net, has both has been racialized. Mm -hmm. And it is the people who receive it have been demonized. So you see interesting things when people think about, and, and this comes in important when you think about the politics of it, who's going to vote for it, who's going to support, how much support in the center is. So for example, just a couple of examples. We have two major housing programs in the United States, one for very poor people and one for relatively well-off people. The one for poor people are the, you know, the housing vouchers for low-income housing. The one for well-off people is the mortgage interest deduction in the, in the tax, which we don't think of as welfare or a housing program, although in terms of dollars, it's three times as great. Now, it's, it's interesting. So for example, if one commits a crime in this country, you are now excluded from receiving that low-income housing. You can't get a low-income housing voucher. You can still keep getting the, the upper-income one. Similar, a similar kind of comparison. There was this big discussion when we were talking about welfare reform where um, you know, welfare, welfare payments cause more kids. So what was happening in 19, one of the reforms in 1996 was the imposition of a family cap. So that if you had more kids, you wouldn't get a bigger welfare payment. You know, it's interesting, at the same time, at exactly the same legislation, there was a big expansion of what's called the, uh, the uh, child tax credit, which gave you more money for each child you have. But notice that there was no requirement in that legislation that you had to be married in order to have to get that for that for that extra child. So part of the way in which we understand what the costs and the benefits are, part of it is through the lens of race. Part of it is by linking. Uh, poor individuals with crime, poor individuals with race, mm -hmm. which you see what I'm saying. So I, yeah. I think there's that aspect of it. Go, going along with that, I wonder if there's um, an element of fear in the way uh, what, that Americans perceive. So, like fear that it's going to help someone else. I think climb a social ladder that you know, and and not them. That it might not benefit them. And not just it doesn't have to be only for Americans. I think there's a case of Switzerland. I think it was Switzerland with their healthcare reform. It, it's recent, right? Like late 80s or, yeah. and, and, and it passed in their um, parliament by like 51%. I mean, they barely had enough votes to get the thing passed. And public support was the same thing in the United States. I mean, they barely got this thing through. And now, you know, 10 years later, 20 years later, they take a poll of whether the Swiss like their healthcare system the way it is now, which is a national healthcare system, and they love it and no one wants to go back. Mm -hmm. You know, and is it this fear of either the unknown, like we aren't sure we're going to benefit, or some, we're afraid someone else is going to you know, climb the social ladder before we are. I just wonder if that, you know, plays into how we well, perceive it, social it also, safety. Well, also, I mean, you're talking about public support 
for welfare uh, benefit. Yeah. Bob made an important how, point how about the role it. racial uh, dimensions play. Another is, is how these welfare programs are administered, right? Mm -hmm. Many of the welfare programs here in the United States are the form of tax credits. So you think like, you know, uh, you, you get an individual uh, uh, benefit. Mm -hmm. In the European, they are, uh, you pay into a pool, right? And then out of that pool of money, the programs are run. Mm -hmm. So it's not a sense that, that, that you pay for a discrete service that you get. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, you know, there's some research. The fact that you then sort of think that this is a public good that is being provided, yeah. where everybody contributed, yeah. increases the political support far more than these, uh, in part, racialized and in part, individualized yeah. these tax incentive programs that we have here uh, in, in the United States. So the political support depends a great deal. And I think maybe that was one of the reasons why the Republican uh, opposition to, to a nationalized or a public option was, was, was so vehement because that then uh, probably in terms of the long term political buy in yeah. uh, would be much stronger and would take us much further down the road of socialism, right, than uh, sort of this hybrid system that we have now. I work at a major pharmaceutical company, the biggest in the world. <laughs> and I'm really surprised. I work with some guys that are young, 30 something MBAs. And they are liking the idea of socialism. They said, if I didn't have to worry about my child's, uh, uh, my kids' uh, health care and their college education, I'd be happy to pay more taxes. I was shocked when I heard them say that. And I think I read recently where the trend in the United States is more positive toward the idea of socialism or providing more of a social safety net for people, which I'm glad to hear. No, I have a, I have a, a relative by marriage who lives in Denmark and has yeah. three children and is extremely happy and would probably not come back here to live. But you know, I mean, it, it's also important, in, in part, I mean, many of these, particularly Scandinavian healthcare systems, they're more generous, but they're also, I mean, they reform them constantly, yeah. right? I mean, uh, like with, with the unemployment insurance, I mean, these generous benefits had a lot of dysfunctional effects in, in the 70s, that you know, absenteeism in, in, in Sweden was through the roof. Uh, but, you know, boom, that they had a reform, they made it much more uh, restrictive and, and much more oversight, and the problem is, is, is solved. So um, they, they really, uh, they, they view welfare programs increasingly also as, as a form of increasing their economic efficiency, right? That they realize that, I mean, in, these are small countries that are highly export dependent. I mean, in the United States, where it's only 40% only of the GDP is, 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 is dependent on, on, on exports. In countries like Sweden, Switzerland, it's 70%. I mean, they're far more integrated, far more globalized. But what this also means is you're much more exposed to the vagaries of a global market economy, right? If there's a downturn in the US, boom, all of a sudden, uh, you know, entire sectors are, are, are wiped out. So the, 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 the labor market tends to be far more volatile. And so historically, there has been a recognition. If you want to continue public support for free trade, right? you have to have some compensation me mechanisms. Because if you don't compensate the losers of trade through these welfare programs, well, what's the alternative? It's protectionism, right? And that is, is, has its own set of, of, of problems. So to some extent, the, the, the expansion of the social safety net is a byproduct of the, 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 the deepening the increasing global reach of, 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 of markets. And, and so these two things go hand in hand. And that's where politics matters. That's why I sort of got irritated with, with, with sort of this Marxist analysis before, where you know, it, it sort of seemed to leave out the political dimensions uh, altogether. All, all, all and uh, this, any, any questions for direct? <laughs> um, I was wondering, you touched a little bit about um, how systems can impact poverty, you know, and, and people's lives. Um, and so I wondered how, if CRS has given any thought about, um, with their giving and with their um, development work, how they might in turn impact those systems, like the systemic root causes of some of these you know, yeah. some of the poverty they're trying to alleviate. Yes, actually, um, 
many of the work do 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 have the question is whether or not CRS and its work have affected some of the systems and structures that uh, promote or support injustice in in these countries. And the answer is in fact yes. That uh, use a case from India where uh, you know we had been working in the villages and CRS works with local partners and. Um, many of the programs enable people to empower themselves to see that they have rights, that, that they um, uh, can engage the, 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 the local structures. And I remember being in a village in India at one point and I was told that uh, the villagers had gone down to the local